The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Realizing the Promise of Perioperative Immunotherapy in Resectable Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. How to Modernize Best Practices Based on New Evidence and Better Multidisciplinary Alliances. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YRK860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Glad you all could join us today. Uh, it's, so this is sort of a, a road show uh, I've been doing with Dr. Al Torki. We've done this a few times. Hopefully we'll try and bring some new stuff to the uh, agenda today. It, there is a lot of new things happening. And, and so that's the goal is to keep everyone up to date on the latest uh, in this exciting space of perioperative immunotherapy for uh, resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, my uh, co-chair today, Dr. Al Torki, is uh, the vice chairman of cardiothoracic surgery and chief thoracic surgery at Whale Cornell Medicine. He's the David B. Skinner professor of uh, thoracic surgery uh, and uh, perhaps one of the most accomplished thoracic surgeons around. And perhaps. so I'm, I'm just lucky to, to be here. Perhaps, <laughs> yes. <best>. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you to all of you uh, who, who were uh, kind enough to join us today. I think it's no surprise to everyone here that um, the landscape for non-small cell lung cancer uh, as a whole is shifting extremely fast. You see this paper that was just published last year with all of the new drugs that have been FDA approved in the metastatic setting and a few very important uh, landmark uh, advances in terms of the perioperative uh, setting. Uh, and this is a woefully out of date uh, paper that was done by the leaders in the in the uh, discipline just a year ago. Now multiple new pieces of information coming forward with uh, perioperative immunotherapy. It's not just the systemic treatments that are evolving at rapid pace. We have pivotal data. This is uh, Dr. Al Torki himself presenting at the World Lung on the CalGB trial, uh, exploring sublobar resection. I'm of the strong opinion that we need to start integrating all these different pieces of data, although today we're talking mostly about locally advanced disease. So here's a patient uh, from my practice. Uh, can we treat PANCOS with perioperative therapy? We don't really have dedicated data for these patients that's, of, you know, that's recent, certainly not with immunotherapy. 76-year-old patient with T4N0 squamous cell carcinoma, good PFTs, ECOG1. She has some shoulder pain. Um, this lesion is going into the T2 vertebrae. You can see it encroaching there with some destruction of the vertebral body. Um, what do you guys think? Is this resectable disease? Yes, no, borderline, I'm not sure. So let's discuss uh, the data we have on this. So yeah, the, as I was saying, the, the two uh, main trials that we have that, to derive some guidance around this are Checkmate A16, which was published about a year ago. Um, for the sake of simplicity, it's basically comparing patients of stage 1B to 3A uh, assigned to nivolumab plus uh, chemotherapy versus platinum doublet. We'll sort of skip over the nevo ipi stuff. Uh, primary outcomes are EFS and PCR. Nadim 2 is very similar, only that it's uh, exclusively for patients with 3A, 3B disease who are randomized to nivolumab plus uh, uh, carbopaclitaxel versus carbopaclitaxel alone. And those who got Nevo preoperatively got a six month course of adjuvant nivolumab. Um, it's a smaller trial, academically run, but it's very important in terms of understanding the results of 816 uh, because of this. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to uh, the bottom right over here where uh, the academic group was much better in terms of providing us with uh, clinical staging. So you can see that these are N2 patients, T3, N1 patients. There's a, about 10% where they're T4, N0 or T4, N1. These are classifications that we don't have from 816 in terms of clinical staging. Uh, and so this is useful to, to, uh, to add to our, our understanding. And uh, very importantly, a third of the N2 patients were multiple N2. A lot of people would consider that unresectable at baseline, but not the Spanish. Um, outcomes, PCR was comparable between the two trials. They both had vastly superior PCR in the, um, in the uh, chemo nivolumab arm. Slightly better in Nadim 2, not quite as good as Nadim 1, where it was about 63%. 
Is this because of the dosing of the carbopipitaxel? Is it because that was a, an overcall based on the pathologist and with third party review, there was a more uh, rigorous review? We, we, don't, we don't know, but clearly comparable outcomes between the two. When we look at overall survival, which is what we care about in our patients, they also have comparable improvements. Very clearly, a 12% uh, difference between the chemo nevo patients and the chemo patients at two years, a odds ratio of 0.57. Um, and in the Nadim 2, it was statistically positive with a uh, hazard ratio of 0.4, favoring Nevo chemo. 84% overall survival at two years is unheard of in stage three, really benchmark setting um, outcomes for these patients. PCR seems to confer much better outcomes for our patients, so achieving a PCR is a desirable uh, thing. And this was true in Checkmate A16. It was also true in the DEEM. You can see almost a flat line in the DEEM uh, in, in the patients who got chemo nivolumab here. Uh, really remarkable results. Remember, that was a third of the patients. So when we compare the two trials, there's some really important things to pick out uh, between them. Obviously, 816 is a larger trial, 358 patients versus 90. Um, the endpoints are similar. The uh, stages are different, 383B in uh, Nadim 2, a much broader stage inclusion in 816. 816 is a pure neoadjuvant, which is, whereas Nadim 2 is periadjuvant, and it's important to take note of that because we will get data on periadjuvant trials in the coming year or two, uh, and they will also, no doubt, change the landscape. Uh, progress to surgery, which has been a criticism of 816, 83% of patients not making it to the OR in, in Checkmate 816, 93% in Nadim 2. Uh, I think this speaks to the uh, maturity and experience of these high-volume treatment centers. The Spanish have been conducting neoadjuvant trials for the better part of 30 years now, going back to the late 80s and early 90s when they published their first one in New England. Um, and this is also true in terms of the R0 rate, which was higher in the Nadim 2 and more comparable to what we'd expect from our high quality surgical centers, 93% of stage 3A and 3B patients having a complete resection. I think that's remarkable. Overall survival, however, is comparable, although uh, 84 versus 82 percent, where Checkmate 816 had quite a bit of a lower stage patients, um, makes you think uh, that maybe perioperative will be a, a winning strategy. What was the cost of adding nivolumab to chemo for these patients? It was minimal. There was no increment in adverse events of any cause or uh, event or grade three four events. Surgery related adverse events were not. Uh, increased either 11.4 grade 3 4 um, adverse events after surgery in patients who've received chemo nivolumab. If you look at the latest iteration of the GTSD for lobectomy, we're talking about grade 3 4 event rates for 95% patients upfront surgery, mostly stage 1 lung cancers in the 8 to 9% range. These are much more complicated patients having more extensive surgery with comparable adverse event rates. I think that's important to note. Quality of life is maintained with the receipt of preoperative chemoimmunotherapy. So don't worry about your patients coming to the OR uh, completely worn down by the treatment. Uh, oncologists are now able to deliver treatment in a very safe way. We now have to learn how to interpret pathology reports, which are going to change dramatically. Uh, your pathologist should be able to report things like percent RVT, which is the percent of residual volume of tumor. Uh, they should be definitely reporting major pathological response, which is less than 10% viable tumor. They should report whether there's been a PCR. It's a lot more work for pathologists, and hopefully new technology will facilitate their workflows. But it's important because EFS is dictated partly by the degree of response. So you can see here, um, Mariano Provencio presented this at ASCO last year, where you see uh, increments in EFS survival based on the degree of response. A lot of questions about what to do with patients who might have persistent N2. If you are one of those people who chooses to mediastinally restage your patients after induction, well, uh, this is nice data from Janice Taub saying that if you had a, P a PCR or 0% RVT in the primary tumor and the lymph node, you have your best response. These are the PCR patients. If you've had a PCR in the primary tumor and persistent disease in the lymph node, you have the same survival as if it's the reverse persistent disease in the primary and PCR in the lymph node. Um, the worst survival, obviously, is patients who have residual disease in both, uh, in both fields. So again, I advocate for patients to go on to surgery 
Uh, regardless, because you get all this information, it's important prognostically. And as I said, the morbidity from surgery is not that bad. If you are okay with operating for stage one, you should be okay to operate for this. Um, extent of resection. These were data uh, presented by uh, Stephen Broderick at ITSOS uh, this, this fall. I think it's important and surprising to see that the, all those, albeit small cohort of patients who had a pneumonectomy had remarkably good survival. We have 76% EFS, so that suggests that their OS is even better uh, at two years. And, and so clearly through the 816 process, these patients were reasonably well selected, must have been physiologically fit. But I would not say that pneumonectomy is a, uh, is a contraindication to considering a patient for preoperative therapy. If you think they can tolerate it physiologically and you think it might be required, then I think it's an acceptable pathway. And um, I'll mention a few things about some of the trials that are ongoing or for which we'll be getting results that, should, uh, that you should be aware of regarding this specific issue. Minimally invasive uh, or thoracotomy. So one of the findings was in the stage three patients in 816, there were more patients who had a lobectomy, more patients who had a minimally invasive. Um, there's a difference, if you just look at the blue curves, uh, forget the chemo, because we're not giving preoperative chemo probably almost at all, except for uh, specific circumstances. So we're comparing the blue curves. There seems to be less uh, good survival in patients who had a thoracotomy or conversion, but that's also probably because they had more complex disease or probably it's probably just an um, artifact of higher stage in those patients. What about R0? Uh, like I said, there was some criticism about the lack of uh, R0s in the uh, 816 cohort. It didn't seem to affect EFS that much. It's only a 10% decrease in EFS in those who, few patients who did have an R1, R2. And no one here wants an R1, R2. I mean, that's obviously not what we're going for. But evidently, um, these patients still have a reasonable outcome. Um, and uh, although we're not <laughs> aiming to do incomplete resections, there are probably ways to salvage the patients who do have incomplete resections. All right, a little bit about what's on the, on the horizon. So I, I wanted to, to spend a couple moments talking about uh, the latest results of the LCMC3, which were published in Nature Medicine. This is a beautiful effort by a consortium of uh, US uh, thoracic oncology teams. Um, and it's a phase two trial. It's the largest trial of its kind, looking at pure uh, IO, chemo-free, neoadjuvant treatment. Patients got two doses of uh, neoadjuvant atezolizumab and then went on to surgery. Uh, there were pretty strict guidelines about which patients. It was similar 1B to 3A, but the 3As, you know, were, were a little bit more restrained uh, than, than they were in 816. And then adjuvant therapy as dictated by usual care. So the, the pathological regression forest plots are not as dramatic as 816 or Nadim, but the survival curves are impressive. So does the benefit of immunotherapy sort of confer survival advantage despite the uh, perhaps more, uh, less extensive pathological response? It's, a, it's an excellent and provocative question. And we don't really have any trials, uh, large scale trials anyways, comparing immunotherapy alone to uh, chemo immunotherapy, but it's a compelling question because obviously no patients really get excited about the idea of getting chemo. Um, this is a really cool study that uh, Dr. Al Torki led. Um, I put this picture because it's really the perfect example of all the kids playing in the sandbox together nicely. There's some systemic therapy, patients got some dervalumab, there's some radiation, but it's not too much radiation, low dose SBRT, and then the surgeons get to operate in a, in a nice uh, cleaned up safe field. Um, so just for um, simplicity, I won't go through the design, but, but it's randomized. Patients got two doses of dervalumab alone versus two doses of dervalumab where they got low dose eight gray over three days along with that first dose of, of derva. You can see it doesn't take a genius to see that there's a dramatic improvement in um, pathological response. Nearly 50% of the patients had a major pathological response with the addition of those uh, three doses of uh, SBRT-like uh, radiation. Um, this is chemo-free. It's really interesting, um, and the surgical outcomes were, were uh, exciting. So hopefully this will uh, be uh, something that we'll bring into phase three to be tested against uh, the new standards. Uh, the next trial I'm going to discuss is throwing the kitchen sink at the disease. This the increased trial is presented at ESMO from a Dutch group. These were those borderline resectable patients, kind of like the case I showed you 
at the very beginning. These patients got concurrent chemo radiation plus Nevo plus IPI, and then went on to surgery. It's a small trial of select patients. I'll draw your attention to the 81% grade 3, 4 event rate. I think that's a lot. Um, but on the flip side, they had nearly 60 plus, well, 60 plus percent um, uh, major pathological response and over, well, 63% PCR. So great uh, response rates, um, uh, slightly concerning toxicity. Surgical outcomes were good, uh, that said. Um, compelling. Is this the way to go? Maybe for some select patients, but I do find it to be incrementally significant on the tox side. This is sort of a compilation of the, if you've put Checkmate 816 aside, a compilation of the periadjuvant trials, phase three trials that are ongoing. Uh, Keynote 671, which is interesting in that um, it's powered for OS in the primary endpoint, so it'll probably be one of the first to report on OS. One concern is that all the patients had to get cisplatin, they weren't allowed to get anything else. And the regimen for squames was gemcitabine, which is perhaps a suboptimal regimen that, that has less IO synergy. So we'll see what happens for those patients in the, in the squamous histologies. Empower uh, O3O, which I don't really have anything specific to say other than I think it'll be extremely positive. AGN, uh, the only thing to mention about this one is that they excluded patients who might need a pneumonectomy. Um, and so these will probably be lower stage patients than 816, for example, and perhaps the other trials. And then um, 77T, which is really quite similar to 816 in terms of its design, only with that extra adjuvant portion of IO. So what happened to uh, my patient? This is her response post-induction. You can see that if you've ever treated oligometastatic disease, this is what happens to the bone when it's had a nice response. You get this rim of sclerosis. Still a little bit of destruction there. Uh, it's a near complete metabolic response. So what do you do? Uh, you know, is this a PCR? This is a big operation. The patient needs spinal stabilization. They need a hemivertebrectomy. Well, we, we operated on her because that's, that's what we do. I learned how to do this operation from Garrett Walsh uh, down at MD Anderson. It went smoothly, um, although she had some problems with her rods and had to be re-explored to be re-stabilized. So it's, it's a very morbid operation, uh, but she had a PCR. So could it have been de-escalated, maybe avoid the vertebrectomy? I don't know. Should we be operating on these patients? It's hard to know. Uh, I hope to, that we do because I think they can get good outcomes and be cured. So my take home message here is uh, in 2023, the most impactful tool at the thoracic surgeon's disposal is highly active preoperative precision therapy. So I encourage you all to get biomarker testing on your patients and to consider these treatments uh, as much as possible. Uh, and if any of you are interested in coming to Montreal, uh, June 16th, 17th, we have a great early stage meeting. Dr. Al Torki has uh, already told us he'll be there, and uh, I hope you'll come. It's F1 weekend, so I'm just uh, shamelessly plugging that. Dr. Al Torki, all yours. Thank you, John. Okay, so ever since I've been doing thoracic surgery, there's been this ongoing debate, never resolved of do you give adjuvant therapy or new adjuvant therapy, whether it's chemo or chemo radiation or what have you. And there are some very strong arguments, I would say, for doing adjuvant therapy. Number one, there is no surgical delay. We all know that patients, by the time they hit your office for surgery, they've already been running around for an average, I would say, of 60 days. So there is a lot of delay before they see you, and there is good evidence that delay is associated with poor outcome. Surgery following new adjuvant ICI can be more difficult. Now, the data here are very, very subjective, and one surgeon's difficult operation is another's easy operation. But those of you who have operated after chemo radiation and sometimes after chemotherapy know that these are challenging cases, and there is no reason to assume that new adjuvant immune, immunotherapy would be less complex. There is a few data emerging about that. There's a proven benefit for adjuvant therapy. I mean. Think of it, in the last 30 years, the only thing that really worked, not so much, but worked a little bit, was adjuvant chemotherapy. 
And of course, immunotherapy is thought to be more effective in the setting of minimal tumor burden. So if you get rid of all the cancer, maybe your immunotherapy will work better. That is also a subjective opinion, not supported by any data. So there are four uh, randomized trials all industry sponsored. Well, one of them is being, uh, two of them are actually being run through cooperative groups. ANVIL is being run through the uh, US intergroup trial. And NCI BR, BR31 is being run by, uh, by the Canadian uh, group. And uh, these employ either NEVO or Dervalumab, Empower 010, and PEARL are run by um, Genentech Roche and uh, Merck. And the first one out of the gate was Empower 010, and it's almost coming up on two years now since the results of Empower 010 was presented at ASCO. And this really is a, a, a breakthrough trial. I must say the results are completely surprising to me when they did come out. So they took patients with com a global trial, patients with completely resected stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer, uh, regardless of pdl one expression. They had to have cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. So that was, and it couldn't be carboplatin, it had to be cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, up to four cycles of that. And then randomization happened after you completed the chemotherapy, not necessarily all four cycles, but after the chemo. So if you did not get chemo for whatever reason, or if you get disease progression, you're out. And then you get randomized to a TESO every three weeks for a total of 16, uh, 16 doses? Yeah, 16 cycles of a TESO. So one year or best supportive care. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival, and it was tested hierarchically in the way that the statistician designed it. Is the first the, uh, the first uh, target population is patients in who uh, who have PDL1 expression, stage two to three A, with PDL1 expression in one percent or more of the tumor cells. If it was positive in this group, then you test it in the second target population, which is DFS in all patients with stage 2, 3A, regardless of pdl one expression. And if it was positive after that, you did it in the uh, intention to treat population which included stage 1B. Overall survival was designated as a key secondary endpoint. So at ASCO, like I said, the, the, the results were presented. And here, just to show you the highlights of this, so it's a mainly uh, two-thirds were men, two-thirds had no non-squamous histology, PDL1 expression uh, was present in roughly a little bit over 50% of the patients. This was a, uh, a, a group of patients that had a significant proportion of patients with stage three, about 50% had stage two, and a little over 10% of the patients had stage 1B. Uh, this is again reflected in the burden of nodal disease. Again, as you can see, N2 about a third, N1 about a third, and the rest are N0. And they had lobectomy, uh, in the majority of cases. The other thing I will draw your attention to is that 83% of the patients, or 80% of the patients had mediastinal node dissection and the rest had sampling. So these guys had the Cadillac treatment, cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, a lobectomy, mediastinal node dissection. This is the best that you can get. That may not be necessarily reflective of many patients that we see in actual clinical practice, but it is a good place to start. So the primary endpoint, which is uh, disease-free survival in patients with stage two to three A, that express PDL1 in one percent or more of the tumor cells, there was a significant improvement in disease-free survival over best supportive care. At two years, it was sixty. Uh, uh, two years, it was seventy-four percent versus sixty-one percent. The um, uh, hazard ratio was 0 0.66, which is equivalent to. Uh, a 34% reduction in the risk of uh, dying or recurrence. In all randomized patients with stage 3A, there was also a significant improvement in disease-free survival favoring the atezolizumab arm. The hazard ratio was 0.78, but as you can see here, it approaches unity. In the ITT population, which, which, which included the patients with stage 1B, uh, the follow-up was, n there appeared to be a benefit for atezo, but uh, did not cross the statistical significance boundary, so these patients are still being followed for that particular endpoint. So this is uh, a, a, an unplanned post hoc exploratory analysis to see what the impact is on the various demographic and clinical variables on, uh, on, on, on DFS in the target population, again, stage two to three A that expressed 
uh, PDL1 in more one percent or more of the tumor cells. As you can see across the age groups, gender, race, uh, both histologies really, but more so in the non-squamous histologies. The greatest benefit was in patients with stage 3A and in patients with uh, uh, positive tumor burden. Uh, the numbers for EJFR and ALK were really small, precluding any meaningful uh, conclusions here, and, it's, and certainly the ADORA trial renders that conversation really moot at this point. So, one of the issues that arose is if DFS is positive, what, is, what are the data driven by? Uh, so it was mainly driven by the high PDL1 expressors. So this is the overall group of, of the stage 2 to 3A uh, that expressed PDL1 in 1% or more. But as you can see, for those that expressed PDL1 in 1 to 49% of the patients, it is true that the hazard ratio was 0.87, but it did cross unity. And the main effect was really driven by those that expressed PDL1 in 50% or more of the tumor cells. When you look at the hazard ratio here, I think it was 0.43. And think about that for a second, because it means there's a 57% reduction in the risk of dying or recurrence from lung cancer in that group. That's an amazing thing to, uh, that you know, I personally have never seen. Now, this, the top line includes all patients with ALK and EGFR mutations. So the thinking was maybe these were sort of uh, muddying the water here, but even when you take out the EGFR and the ALK population out of this, the data really doesn't change very much. And you can still see the DFS is primarily driven by the 50 percenters, although the primary, uh, the primary population for which the study was designed was this one here. So anything else would be an exploratory analysis. So in fact, the FDA in October, think about this for a second. So I think, I think the data was presented in June at ASCO. In October of the same year, the FDA approved the TISO for adjuvant treatment of following resection of, uh, uh, and platinum-based chemotherapy in patients with stage 2 to 3A whose tumors have PDL1 expression on 1% or more of the tumor cells in these United States. Not so elsewhere. For, I think, in Canada, you guys, 50%? 50%, but uh, 816 was approved before the publication. Okay. Yeah. But 50%. But 50%. <laughs> yeah, but, 50%. <laughs> yeah, no, in the adjuvant uh, setting. And, and, uh, and in most of the European Union, it's also, well, not nearly 50%. all the European Union, it's approved for, for, for the 50 percenters. You know, I'm glad we're here. <laughs> it's, it's good to have an option for patients because really these patients have very few options once they've gotten the best treatment that they can get. And then the, the question always arises in your, on, on all your tumor boards is what happens with the patient who got carbotaxol or carbopem? And, and, and the answer is you get a TISO afterwards. Um, another issue that came up is what is the impact of some of the surgical procedures uh, on uh, whether or not you give immunotherapy. Remember immunotherapy, one of the big concerns that we have as surgeons is, is that it, you, know, you can get uh, immune-related pneumonitis, and would it be appropriate to give it to somebody who had a pneumonectomy? And the, the, the argument goes, well, look here. You know, most of the benefit really is driven by the lobectomy group. And the pneumonectomy group, you know, the hazard ratio sort of crosses unity. The bilobectomy group, the same. So. Thinking went, well, if you had a pneumonectomy, you probably shouldn't get it. Now, number one is the trial wasn't designed to test that question, so that's sort of uh, opinion and not data. But uh, Jay Lee actually compared the groups in, in Empower 01, those that had pneumonectomy and those that did not, the lobectomy group. Uh, so here, here are his findings. So uh, again, similar in terms of male gender distribution, similar in terms of non-squamous histology in between the pneumonectomy group as a whole, 180 patients had pneumonectomy and the remainder had lobectomy. Similar in terms of the frequency of stage three and stage two disease, the adequacy of their mediastinal lymph node dissection and the proportion of patients with N2 disease. So a pretty good comparison, even though it was not intended to be that way. They also, I'm one to say that you know, after pneumonectomy, patients are less likely to tolerate chemotherapy as well. Well, that did not prove to be true here. They got as much chemo cisplatinum exposure as the lobectomy group, but perhaps because they are the best of the best of patients. And uh, 
Here, down here, you can see that the, number, the proportion of patients who were hospitalized during adjuvant chemotherapy was similar between those that had lobectomy and those that had pneumonectomy. So for all intents and purposes, there was no great difference uh, between the two groups before being randomized to a TESO. And these are the adverse events associated with uh, a TESO in blue, best supportive care in orange. This here is the pneumonectomy group. And here's here the lobectomy group, and you can just look at this and say, you know, there's no difference really in the AEs that occur following either of those. And well, what about their ability to tolerate a TESO? So treatment was discontinued in roughly about a third of patients in each group. And why was it discontinued? Either to a adverse events, roughly the same, or disease relapse roughly the same. The median treatment duration was 10 months. And this, remember, it was 16 cycles of a TESO. So they all get 16 cycles of a TESO. So that's pretty good. So I think, you know, uh, uh, obviously, we ha one has to individualize in each particular case. But there is no really compelling data to suggest that you should avoid adjuvant immunotherapy in patients who had pneumonectomy. Well, we talked about. Uh, PDL1 expression as being a biomarker that drives the benefit from adjuvant immunotherapy. Another biomarker that we might consider that is not yet standard of care is ctDNA in these patients. And I must say that this trial did a really good job in collecting samples for ctDNA. 600 patients had their samples collected before and after. And as you can see here, the, the orange lines are the best supportive care. The blue lines are the ATEZO groups, OK? So clearly, a positive ctDNA had negative prognostic implications. If you have positive ctDNA, you're going to do poorly. And you're going to do poorly regardless of whether or not you got a TESO or did not. But if you got a TESO with a positive ctDNA, you did better than if you had a ctDNA positive and you got nothing. And the same is true if, you ha if you're ctDNA negative. So, the benefit of adjuvant ATEZO in the, in the target population is um, uh, independent of positive CDDNA. Now, as I told you earlier, that the overall survival was a key uh, secondary endpoint, and uh, it, 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 an analysis was made, and this was presented in World Lung and again at ESMO. And you know, even though it seemed to favor the ATEZO arm, it did not seem to be significant at, uh, so far uh, at the current levels of follow-up with the hazard ratio sort of 0.71, but crossing unity over here. Same trial population, complete uh, R0 resection, and then get randomized, suggest you get chemotherapy, so no mandate for chemotherapy, and then you get randomized to Pembro versus placebo. So this had a co-primary endpoint. The first endpoint was disease-free survival in the overall population, regardless of PDL1 expression. And the secondary endpoint was disease-free survival in patients who had 50% or more PDL1 expression in their tumor cells. So I'm going to, you know, this is just to show you that even though chemotherapy was not mandated, the majority of patients did get chemotherapy. And this is the, primary end, the first primary endpoint, which is regardless of PDL1 expression, very significant improvement in survival. The hazard ratio was 0.76, and the p value was 0.001. That is pretty darn good. Uh, the problem is the secondary endpoint, which was confusing because it flies against every bit of data about the impact of PD, high PDL1 expressors in lung cancer in advanced disease, in the ATEZO tri uh, trial, and I suspect in many more. And that's not significant. What are the differences between the two? Well, uh, really, the distribution of stage three was much higher than uh, in, in the EMPOWER trial than in the um, uh, Keynote uh, trial. This had more stage two than, than the EMPOWER did. Both have had the, roughly the same proportion of stage 1b. So it seems, although it's, it's hard to sort of compare trials, but it seems like EMPOWER had w more advanced disease in it. Um, uh, the distribution of PDL1 expression was roughly the same between the two groups, but the main differences really are in the primary endpoints that were tested. On January 26, 2023, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for adjuvant treatment following resection and platinum based chemotherapy for patients with stage 1b, 2, and 3a non small cell lung cancer. 
The approval was based on the results from the Keynote 091 trial. So, and in conclusion, the use of immunotherapy in the perioperative management of resectable lung cancer is a major advance. There's no doubt about that. You know, this goes back to uh, uh, whether or not you give uh, new adjuvant or adjuvant. And of course, the refrain is we need more bio better bi biomarkers, as we always say at the end of every talk. <laughs> All right, fantastic. It's a lot of data to digest. It's not going to get any simpler, uh, but I'll, I'll echo uh, Dr. Altorki's comments that it's really wonderful to have all these options for both patients who get preoperative or uh, postoperative. Ah. Uh, we have a few cases to go through just to sort of illustrate some, some situ clinical scenarios, and then we'll be happy to take some questions. So the first case is a patient, Dr. Altorkis. You want to walk us through yeah. this one? Yeah, so this is a, uh, a, a lady that I saw who I had done a lobectomy on, on the opposite side, uh, like, I don't know, like 10 years, make believe 10 years previously. And uh, she came back with uh, this big tumor in her left upper lobe. Uh, uh, she had a basilar segmentectomy, so almost a lobe, biopsy proven 6.3 adenocarcinoma T3 and 0 stage 2B. She did not have an EGFR mutation. Her PDL one was 5%. Her FEV1 was 1.5. And we did a VQ that showed uh, uh, the left side had 45% of her perfusion. That's, uh, she had a left orchomy, left upper lobe. She had uh, solid predominant adenocarcinoma PT4N1. <laughs> Get adjuvant chemotherapy followed by adjuvant atezo. So I'm happy, this is a good point to have a discussion about this. Uh, my concern was that uh, she's an elderly woman and uh, the tumor appeared quite central and uh, perhaps a borderline resectability and perhaps if she is not responding to the treatment, she might progress and preclude the probability of resection. That seems very fair. Uh, I'm just curious. Actually, I'll take advantage of this to take one of the questions from the from the queue here. Um, the question is: In Empower O and O, the patients included were postoperative stage one B to three A. Well, most of them. Um, this is this is stage three A as well. But the question is: What do you do with postoperative three A, three B, three C? If you happen to find that, I don't. I don't know how. After resection? After resection. Are you recommending they should all get Well, atezo? just remember that, uh, that uh, the, the staging with Empower was in the old staging system, right? So, so say this was T4N2, which would be sort of beyond the... This one here? Let, let's say it was an N2, T4N2. Which, it's even more advanced stage. Would you recommend they get adjuvant atezo in that case? Uh, it would be stage 3C, right? A, a, correct, yeah. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. According to the current right. I mean, indication, I the answer would be yes. What, what if what if they had been to sort of a less uh, glorious surgeon and they had a positive margin? Would you would you still recommend they get adjuvant Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I you know the it is the, the 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 shrinking area of options here once you get to a tumor like that. I mean, what are you going to offer a seventy seven year old who has a positive margin? I mean, I don't think radiation does a whole lot. In fact. It's probably not good for her. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I think immunotherapy is a we're fairly well tolerated until it's not. Yeah, I agree. I think that's yeah. What, yeah. why these trials are so important. Yeah. They've opened yeah. so many important options for their pa these patients. You know, I, I mean, I, this is this is not sort of planned uh, discussion here. But I have a patient, and we all have anecdotes. But you know, you learn from your anecdotes sometimes. And I have a patient who had T4 in one that we treated on the radiation IO trial, and I actually left disease on his left anterior descending, mm -hmm. and uh, he got uh, focused radiation to the heart area, and uh, adjuvant dervalumab, and he is the guy is five years out. Yeah, that's a big deal. I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, I think I think the, this whole thing with uh, immunotherapy, even though we don't understand everything behind it and how it works and so forth, I think is a real game changer. And uh, you know, we should be open minded about. We that. should keep yeah. Uh, yeah. the LEDs yeah. of uh, hopefully all of our patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was a 76 year old man, former smoker, has this tumor. He. Uh, had a biopsy proven 9.8 centimeter squamous cell T4 N0 stage 3A. PDL1 was 60%. He had a bunch of stents. He was on Plavix. He had an implantable AICD. His FEV1 was 1.5, and the VQ is the same. Uh, 
uh, as the previous case, although we did do another VQ in this one. We gave him new adjuvant chemo IO, and he took it like a champ. I was really worried about him. And uh, he had uh, an MPR. To, I, I was shocked because uh, radiographically, the tumor did not change. And, uh, and, and, and by PET, the tumor did not change very much. You know, the SUV went down a bit. But uh, it's, it's always a good lesson. Uh, we learned that from the days of new adjuvant chemotherapy, that you know, radiographic response is not a correlate of pathologic response. So we found a 13.8 poorly differentiated squamous cell invading the chest wall with negative margin, negative nodes. Would you give him adjuvant therapy, Jonathan? If I had to... Uh guess what the future will bring is that this patient will likely get adjuvant therapy. Um, I think it's going to be a patient-specific discussion in most cases. I'm curious because I probably would have given chemoimmunotherapy to the first patient. Does the centrality of the lesion matter for you? Is the fact that this is more peripheral, that you don't have higher issues in this? No, there's actually, uh, the, did the, have if, you, uh, if you look, you know, the SVC was compressed and the tumor okay. sort of extended to the base of the neck and was compromising his subclavian vein. All right, so this is one of uh, my patients. Um, it's a complicated case. So she's uh, 75. She has a 20-pack year history, but quit many years ago. Uh, she comes with these bilateral lower lobe lesions. Uh, they're both sort of directed up more in the S6 region. She has really excellent lung function, ECOG zero. The SUV on the uh, right side is 11 for a 4.8 centimeter tumor and 19 for a 2.7 centimeter tumor on the left. We did a PET, we did EBUS staging, the mediastinum is bone dry, and uh, we had good cellularity with negative lymph nodes. So it's sort of, sort of uh, what seems to be bilateral early stage, stage one tumors, but most people are recommending PTNAs. I think that's reasonable. So th that's what we did, um, and we're lucky. Um, shockingly, uh, where I am, we, we do uh, reflex NGS for all of these needle biopsies even if they are early stage. And we do, um, the information is, is useful. So uh, on the right lower lobe, it's a KRAS a G12F, a rare KRAS mutation, very unusual. And there's also an IDH2 mutation, not really sure the significance of that. And the PDL1 is 1%. That's the right-sided 4.8 uh, centimeter tumor. On the left side, we have KRAS G12C with a PIC3 CA um, that's picked up and a PDL1 of 100%. So just by probabilities, the likelihood that these are related tumors is exceedingly low. Um, so it supplements the usual uh, histological classification, but they're, they're clearly two different tumors. So we have a clinical T2BN0 on the right and a clinical T1CN0 on the left in a fit patient. So these, this was a pre-treatment scan on the left and post-treatment. I cheated a little bit. The windows aren't exactly the same, but there was reduction in size in both. The right lower low went from 4.8 to 3.7, and the left from 2.7 to 1.3. I don't know if this is the right thing. I had a very long, extensive discussion with the patient, but we did do bilateral staged S6 VAT segmentectomies. You know, I, I feel like that's uh, important for this patient. She had other GGOs elsewhere in the lung that might come up and be, need to be treated in the future. Um, but that, we had decent margins on this. But I, I do think that preoperative therapy created a scenario that. What did you have PCR? So, so she had um, no pathological response on the right-sided tumor. It was 100% RBC. <laughs> it doesn't mean she'll recur. She, she was no negative. And on the left, we're waiting for the path response. Okay. I don't have it yet. That pretty much brings our program to a close. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YRK. 860. This activity is supported by educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, a member of the Roche Group, and Merck and Company Incorporated.